Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Dot Food Podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Anthony, Anthony Aikman. Looking forward to our conversation today, Anthony. Yes, very much, Simon. Thank you. Yeah. So, Anthony's got a, a, a book out. Um, when did you When did you publish your book? It's a while ago, yeah. No, earlier this year. Earlier, earlier this year. year. Yes, it's year. just it's oh, it's yeah. only now kind of getting gaining a bit of traction. So it takes a bit of time. So it's very recent. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we've spoken the two of us about the the name of the the title of the book um, because, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's called Lucky Bastard or Lucky Bastard, I guess, if you're from the south of uh, England. <laughs> um, and and it, it, for me, it's a great kind of a juxtaposition, right? Um, yes. L- lucky bastard. I, I was uh, saw something from um, from what's the guy's name? One of the one of the trauma guys, not Bessel van der Kolk, the Czechoslovakian guy, Gabo Mate. Yeah, he took he had a course called the Wisdom of Trauma, the Wisdom yes. of Trauma, and I yes. thought that that's a great juxtaposition. Um, yes, uh, uh, and wisdom and trauma; those are things that you don't hear together. And yes. uh, l- lucky bastard, yeah, you hear, you hear in. We don't hear it often in in terms of uh, in terms of adoption, but you hear yes, it in other in other ways. So, you were telling me that uh, you can't take the credit for it for them. Yeah. No, not entirely. My wife is very witty and quick and she came up with the title I was I I did want to use the word bastard because I kind of wanted to own that it was interesting that uh, when I was a kid at school and uh, we studied Shakespeare so we studied King Lear and in King Lear Gloucester has two sons uh, Edgar who's a good guy and Edmund who is a piece of shite and Edmund is a bastard because Gloucester had him out of wedlock with another woman. And so he's called Bastard. And in Shakespeare's day, there was a belief that was current, and my teacher told us about that, that bastards were believed to be inherently evil. And if you looked at how Edmund behaved in the play King Lear, I don't want to be too erudite about that, but I mean, he is really a terrible, terrible role model. So you know, as a young person who was aware of being adopted and who presumed, at the time it was just a presumption, um, one of the many uh, uh, stories you could make up about what your genesis had been, that my parents were unmarried and therefore I was a bastard. It seemed like a kind of curse that you had to work through. And in a way, um, you can then proudly own it at a certain point, take it away. I think it was um, in... uh, Oliver Twist, because there's a, there are many, many bastards in, in, in English literature, you know, from uh, Tom Jones, um, Oliver Twist, uh, Heathcliff in, in uh, that great Yorkshire novel. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Wuthering Heights, just set around the corner from where you live. Uh, they were all illegitimate, or they were all, uh, they were all illegitimate, all bastards. And uh, it was in uh, Oliver Twist that, uh, Mr. Brownlow, who was Oliver's um, uh, kind of patron, he admonished Oliver's half brother, who called him a bastard, and said that's you know that that word only reflects badly on you. But it is something that we can own, you know. I suppose it's like uh, Black Americans can use uh, a word that we would not be allowed to use; we'd be called racist. But they can own that word, and I suppose I felt that I could own the word bastard. Yeah. Yeah. With a bit of a tongue in cheek. With a bit of a tongue in cheek. Um, and I, I guess it goes down to, it goes to uh, how long, you know, like will it, uh, when was Shakespeare writing? 16th century, was it? or 15th? Yeah, 17th century, the beginning okay. of the 1600s. Yes, late yeah. 1500s. Yes. And so, that was, that... Yeah, so the villainization of... Uh, of bastards goes back a long time. It, it, it's, yes. in, it, it's in the culture for roots as long as Shakespeare and probably before that, I guess. Mm. And of course, there were many uh, uh, bastards in England in high society. I mean, many uh, people had illegitimate children who they kept, including the royal family. The only downside, if you were the bastard of a king, is that you weren't in line for the throne. Yeah. But uh, you probably got some other perks. Yeah. 
and I, I see, uh, I, I, I see this, and I feel this myself about uh, us adoptees trying to change yes. other people's perceptions of us, and I think that's a real, real uphill battle, right? I think a lot of people, it's quite interesting that my book, which is an adoption memoir, I tell my adoption story. And quite a few people who've read it and uh, were well um, entertained, enjoyed the book, said it opened kind of like windows. For them. They'd never thought about it before. Many people don't really think about, because it's not their experience, they wouldn't think that there's anything different. You know, if you're adopted, well, you're adopted. You know, that's okay. You know, that's get on with it. You know, I mean, uh, one of my uncles who was a, a doctor and in the 1950s would have facilitated quite a He was, in those days, GPs used to do, um, a, 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 what do you call it, childbirth and all of that sort of stuff as well. It was a part of the territory. And uh, he said to me, you know, when we were having this discussion, he said, well, he never imagined that uh, that was anything but the best solution for the mother, for the ad adoptive parents who suddenly became a family. The mother's so problem was solved and the child's problem was solved. And everyone could just get on with their lives as if nothing had ever happened and it didn't leave any scars. So yeah. it's very naive how many people can be about adoption. And the I, I think about... I think about this quite a lot at the moment because the the primal wound only came out in 1992 or 93, yes. I think. So, yes. and, and she was the first woman to first uh, author to point towards this. Yes. And these days, uh, these days, you know, I've been listening to a couple of podcasts with uh, Bessel van der Kolk this morning uh, whilst walking the dog, and. He didn't write the body keeps of the score or release it to 2014, right? So this is still this is that that book's only 10 years old, right? It sold five million, it sold five million copies. Um, it takes a long time for the for the world to change. Like, didn't didn't it take them two thousand years to go from being um thinking that these the sun went round the earth yes. to the yeah you know, to the to the earth going round the sun that that took like 2000 yes. years to 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 change and oh. same with flat earth like oh. the flat earth thing and and still people think that there's flat earth so things take a long time to change for, you know to to spread and and i, I we we see so much uh, of adoptees like trying to get people to understand our stuff but they've got their stuff to, oh. to, to, to deal with. So we shouldn't really be surprised when they're not really up for it. We have to be, if we feel drawn to that advocacy and spreading yes. the word about adoption trauma, we have to be kind of in it for the long term. We have to be persistent. Oh. We have to be creative because their stuff is their stuff. They're, what, they, they don't, they're not bothered about our stuff. No, but I think many people can be interested, just as adoptees are not only interested in things that have to do with adoption. It just happens to be an important part of us, important part of our experience. It forms what we are, not exclusively, but, uh, you know, importantly. But we are interested in all sorts of other things. And so, you know, non-adoptees can also be interested in other sorts okay. of things. But a lot of people just haven't really thought about it. But I but they do, you know, I mean, people are not uninterested. People are not uh, cynical. And they, they, you know, and um, so I, I think it's, uh, I, I, I imagine it appeals to uh, people who've got something to do with what was called the adoption triangle. So if you work out how many people in some ways were involved in that from the triangle, obviously, being the, the birth parents, uh, the adoptee and the, the adoptive parents, and how many people people are caught up in that and when when adoption like the legal adoption was in america they say it was around about two to three percent of the population and if you think how many people were living in america about 200 million people that's a lot of adoptees that's adoptees and then they've all got a mum and dad adoptive they've all got 
biological parents and then siblings, there are a lot of people who in some way are touched by the experience of adoption. You know, they've got, you'll often hear people saying, oh, I had a friend a friend who read my book. He's a Dutch actor and I lived in, in the Netherlands for 20 years almost. And he wrote and said, now I understand much more about my adopted brother. And I didn't know that he had an adopted younger brother. So, you know, it kind of crops up all over the place. You know? Yeah. And quite yeah. quite often in families, as as you know, that parents who, who assume or think that they um, are barren, that they can't have a child, go out and adopt a child and then, hey, presto, before you know it, they're bringing up a baby and they fall pregnant. Yeah. So, uh, so adopted children sometimes have uh, brothers and sisters who are biological children yeah. of their parents. And I think that probably is uh, gives rise to some awkward competition or rivalry. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, that was Nancy Barrio's exp um, uh, experience, wasn't it? She had one biological kid and, and, and one adopted kid. And, uh, so and, the, and the difference between the two was what kind of sparked her uh, intuition. Um, so um, healing then, uh, the focus yes. of the podcast, Do, does the word healing, what, well, to what extent does that word um, resonate with you, Anthony? A lot, Simon, because, um, you know, you also, you don't realise sometimes, you don't realise uh, in what ways adoption has affected you. Um, in fact, even writing my book, I realised um, I thinking about it a lot when I was analysing certain things, I came to realisations that I hadn't had before. Um, you know, you think, well, in my case, uh, adoption was, I, I was told when I was 10 years old, it was an accidental telling. So I suddenly found out at the age of 10 that I wasn't who I thought I was, which was a pretty seismic event in the life of uh, an adoptee. And for in nowadays, of course, the, the way people do it is to tell a baby from the, the get-go so the child doesn't ever know, doesn't ever have a moment, doesn't have a red letter day. Um, so that was, you know, required a, quite a lot of an adjustment. Just, you know, kind of feeling that you didn't belong. I suppose that's one of the, the first feelings. And I didn't really interrogate too much at the time about um, why. Um, I just, I actually was sort of ashamed of it i didn't want people to know and yet of course people did know uncles and aunts and grandparents they all knew you know but i didn't want the kids to know because then they'd think i was less than them um that was how i figured it then i later turned that on its head being a precocious uh, little boy i said well i'd learned about the birds and the bees and so i said um well, my parents decided that, that was disgusting, having sex. And so um, your parents are pretty disgusting. My parents weren't like that. They went out and adopted me instead, which is... Yeah. Quite, a, <laughs> you know, quite a creative twist on that, yeah. Quite a creative twist. It didn't occur to me that somebody else must have had sex. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I got that kind of messed up. But at a certain point, you just realised that it was... Um, the information was unavailable. In South Africa, we had an Adoption Act 1923, which has preceded the UK, actually, preceded Scotland and, uh, and uh, Britain, England. Um, so we were quite early with that. But, and then the Act was amended several times, but it was always that there was no disclosure. And so nobody knew anything. In fact, uh, the... So you could never find out. You know, when I did ask my, my dad, when they told me when I was a teenager, and of course, many adoptees will identify with um, not really wanting to talk about adoption with their adoptive parents because they're scared they might hurt them. It might be a reminder of their infertility. It might, you might seem like you um, don't love them or you're ungrateful or something. And gratitude is like a red flag word for adoptees, as you all, yeah. as you all know. And um, so then, uh, you know, it was just told that it was impossible to get that information. So you didn't have a story, you know, you didn't have a story of why you'd been put up for adoption, how, what was your story? You know, your story was different, your origin story. So you didn't have it. Well, you know, you can't sit around moping forever if you're just told 
that you can't ever know. Um, and that's how it was in my life until I was um, about 38 when they changed the law in South Africa. And I think that they, they, they changed the law in 1983, but it was it only kind of came into effect in the about 86, 87. And it was probably because there was a justifiable um, argument presented by the lawmakers that, that, you know, there could be hereditary diseases and a child at least had that right to know that they might have or might pass on hereditary disease. So that made it possible then for um, for me to do a trace. And by then I'd, I'd thought that it was like, you know, this was a, you know, this, you know, I was never going to find out, so why worry about it? You know, they were never going to change the law. And actually, if you think about it, it's quite outrageous. Um, you know, the only person who doesn't know, adoptive parents know your story, perhaps up to a point, biological parents do, but you don't. And you are the person who this is all about, you know. And so it's actually quite, um, you know, can make you very angry when you think about that. Uh, Anyway, then I had the um, opportunity to do to do a trace. But what when we're getting around to healing, what what you know, finding my biological my birth mother uh, was a very healing experience because that did give me access to my origin story, the mystery um, of how it had happened, why it had happened, because. You know, I, I imagine most adoptees fantasize about this or wonder, you know, make up stories, make up a story. Well, maybe it happened like this. Maybe it happened like that. Maybe you wake, make up the worst case scenarios as well to protect yourself, just in case your mother was a low down hooker and your father was a drunk sailor. You know, then um, as long as you've prepared yourself for that, you can't be shocked because I think some adoptees do have quite um, shocking experiences. But of the adoptees who I've known who were wanting to find out, no matter how horrible it was in the worst cases, they were glad that they at least knew that that, that knowledge. And I think that was a, quite a healing thing. And I mean, that's not to, I'm not criticizing uh, adoptees who don't want to find out. I do know uh, some people who, are, who say they're not interested. I'm not quite sure. I'm so curious that I can't imagine why not. But not everybody is like that. And maybe some people are scared of what they might find out and don't want to. But that was certainly a, a healing experience for me, making contact. Um, I was just reading that chapter from my book because it's going to be um, an excerpt. It's going to be published in a, in a newspaper here, online newspaper, when the book hits the main bookstores uh, early next month. And so I was writing about that particular moment. I mean, I was... I was living in Amsterdam at the time, and uh, I was persona non grata with the apartheid government, so I wasn't allowed back into the country. And um, and then the law changed, and uh, I managed to correspond, and I managed to find my mother, but I couldn't get on a plane and come and see her. Uh, but we did communicate, and that was the beginning of certainly of, of, of the healing process for me. I think that, uh, you know, Healing can happen in, in all kinds of other ways. I think you you possibly don't know to what extent adoption has affected you, apart from perhaps feeling angry or deprived that you don't know your origin story. But it does, uh, I mean, it's the primal wound that you were talking about, Nancy Berrier. And, uh, you know, there are other scars. And it goes back because there's a lot of stuff that we internalize when we pre-verbal babies, before we we're born even, sometimes some psychologists have, have you know, as pre-verbal babies, you know, what happened to you when you didn't know? What was that separation like? Well, if you don't know, if you're not let in on the story, you don't know. But it does leave, it does leave marks. And we we do live our life in a response to things that have happened to us. And so later I came to understand although I didn't know it at the time, how adopt, being an adoptee had um, affected quite a lot of my behavior. For one thing, you know, we know about abandonment issues, that 
adoptees are, you know, we were abandoned. Uh, however, Nancy Berry also writes about that whatever kind of gloss somebody might put on it, um, it's very hard for an adoptee not to feel, uh, you know, whether the mother had the best intentions in the world, and many did, um, you know, the uh, the child feels that kind of abandonment. And that's something you carry forward or you can carry forward. And uh, as it happened, I don't know if I'm still <laughs> carry on in this, but I realized that, um, well, I did when I dipped into the literature, when I started reading some of the literature about adoption, I realized that, of course, it is a, a known fact that the divorce rate among adoptees is higher than among the the, the general population. Um, but why would that be? <laughs> uh, and it was quite interesting. After I'd had a succession of um, of failed relationships and marriages and some that had lasted for quite a long time. Um, this is right by then. Um, we talk in the 1990s. I was back in South Africa, just had another um, marriage that crashed and burnt. And I've eventually found myself in uh, having some therapy with a an alternative kind of therapist, not your traditional Freudian type of an analyst, but somebody who was a bit new agey and that sort of stuff. I was desperate enough to try anything at the time. And um, it was quite a few kind of revelations came up. And, and one of them was that um, that the all the women that I had chosen in my life were like my birth mother, who was somebody who abandoned me. And I had had a reunification. I, when I came back to South Africa in 1990, I met my birth mother. And I had a wonderful honeymoon relationship. And it is, you know, with the mother and, and child meeting, it is like a love affair. Um, and it does have some of the aspects of that that can be quite fraught as well. But um, by the end of the 1990s, um, came, she abandoned me again. She kind of uh, broke off our relationship, uh, which is pretty hectic. And that happened at the same time that my my adoptive mother died and my wife left me and we got divorced. So a triple when I, uh, Pardon? A, a triple, triple one. one. Yeah, exactly. And I just turned 50, you know, <laughs> yeah. sucked that up as well. <laughs> so um, I ended up talking to this uh, counsellor and um, she did point out to me, she said, you know, all the women that you have chosen have been like your birth mother, although you didn't know it. And what I was always doing was cho choosing or being chosen by partners who were likely to abandon me. And that's what happened. Because um, I don't know if I'm not necessarily speaking on behalf of all adoptees, but I was a kind of very faithful, loyal or loyal type of person. And maybe that was a need that that one had. And when you latched onto somebody, you latched onto somebody. So, I mean, I like never broken up with a girlfriend. It had always been the girlfriend breaking up with me. And it was what another therapist or guy writing about adoption, I've got his name, I can't find it, called repetition compulsion. It's that you keep doing the same thing again. It's a bit like I'm, was it Einstein who said it's a thing of insanity. You do the same thing again yeah. and you expect a different, a different result. result yeah. except, except you don't know you're doing the same thing again. You think, oh, this person I've met is so different from the last person, but different in superficial ways, perhaps. But the underlying thing was um, was this, that they were, were likely to abandon me. And, um, and I think after I'd been through that counselling, and I did quite a lot of work on myself, and I also stood up to, to my mother. In fact, um, in fact, it was a kind of ultimatum that she um, she gave me in 1990. And her issue, I mean, it was it was really a control issue. She wanted to control me and she wanted to call the shots. It wasn't, uh, and she's a very nice person. She just had, had a lot of damage herself, not least of having to give a child away uh, for adoption. Um, but um, she wanted to control me and she would have this, what I thought was rather ridiculous uh, thing if she was very happy that I'd come back into her life 
But she was a middle-class uh, woman from a middle-class suburb in Cape Town who didn't want everybody to know that she had had a child out of wedlock. I mean, that's ridiculous, like 40 years before, please, you know. But um, she didn't want to do this. She would, was very selective about who she uh, allowed to know. And it was she who called the shots, not me. So, you know, I was there because she had slept with my father before she was married. Otherwise, I wouldn't have existed. But she would say to me, don't tell anybody who you are. I mean, just those those words were actually very, very hurtful. Um, because, you know, why are you not allowed to be who you are? Because she wants somebody to think that she was a nice girl who hadn't had sex before marriage. I mean, you know, that's kind of disproportionate. So these were kind of um, issues that had been rubbing along. But I think it was a lot of it was a control issue. I later also got to understand that her father, my grandfather, had been an alcoholic, who a bad alcoholic at times, you know, one of not just a lost weekend, but a lost two weeks sometimes. And children of alcoholics do have uh, behavioral issues as well, understandably. And so I think that might have played into it. But at that particular point, she said to me, now, you know, I'm drawing a line in the sand. I don't want you, I'm, I'm making, I'm making up the rules, actually. That's what she was more or less saying. And I said, it's not good enough. I don't accept that. I don't accept that. And these are these are the rules that I'm making up. And that brought an end to our relationship for a time being, for a couple of years, and then there was a reconciliation. But in a way, it was an important moment for me to have actually Rest the control broken pattern. a pattern. Yeah. I broke a, broke a pattern. So um what was it what what was it um what did it what did it feel like in that honeymoon period and what do you think because obviously that honeymoon period didn't um didn't last so you could say you, you could kind of I, I guess you could say well uh, the honeymoon period is is a healing of yes yes know, like a, almost like an instant healing or or but yeah. But then, but then, when the rejection happens, does the does does the healing? You know, is there? Are we back into? Are we we back? We did you no. go back into? No, no, I don't think so. Because you know, some some things were very important, and I was quite you know, and stuff like this. You got to do. You got to put in the work yourself. You got to think about it. Know kind of what you're doing, and maybe she wasn't doing that. The problem is that with a with an adoptee like us, and um, and, a, and a birth mother who's had to give a child away, when you have a reunion, there are you coming into it with different expectations. A child is looking, or or an adopted person, because we are not children. People often talk about adopted child, but it does infantilize us. You know, we are not. You know, you're not an adopted child when you're fifty or forty or thirty. Um, you know, but the mother wants to get the baby back. And that's understandable. You know, when it's tough when you get a man with a beard and a receding hairline and you were expecting your, to get your baby back. And I think for the for me as well, I wasn't looking for another family. I mean, I had a, a, a very loving adoptive family. But they did their best, you know. I mean, I can't fault them on anything. But, um, well, I can. But and I did, you know, because you, you know you tend to act out a lot. But um, you know that that um, the the important thing for me also was through her I had access to more information about myself. She was the one person, obviously, the mother who would know who my father was. I wanted to know who my father was. I wanted to know the story. I wanted to know. Um, uh, you know, what had happened. So finding all of that out filled in all those blank spaces and gave me an origin story, which was, and it doesn't matter. Nobody can take that away from me. You know, if, if uh, uh, you know, had some difficult cousins, just because you, what you realize, <laughs> and adoptees, we've got to be kind of realistic about this. We, we might think that, you know, without thinking about it, that all people in, in 
bio, biological families get on really well with biological yeah. siblings. Not true. <laughs> and we just think we don't get on with our adopted siblings because we come from a different family. But, you know, so we've got to be a little bit kind of like realistic about that. But um, no, I think it was, and you know, there were moments I was kind of conscious of things like this. I was um, born in a Salvation un uh, Army unmarried mother's home in Durban in South Africa. My mother came from Cape Town, which is a thousand miles away. She, I discovered when I found out, had spent three, nine weeks with me, which was the policy of the Salvation Army in those days. I mean, that's quite traumatic for a mother um, because she spent nine, she breastfed me and then she had to wean me. And then she had to wait until one day I would be spirited away. And so, um, so when we had had this reconciliation, when I was back in South Africa, one of, the, one of the very nice things was she came up from Cape Town to Durban. I was with my adoptive parents, my parents. Um, I didn't call them adoptive parents. And we had, um, I think, my 41st birthday party. And she was there. She came there. And we traveled around together. And we went into Durban. And I had found the building where I was born. It was... Um, it had been the unmarried mother's home uh, for Salvation Army. It was now an after-school, aftercare play centre, something for kids. And I'd been there before, done a recce, spoken to the woman in charge and said, can I come here with my, my mother, my birth mother? This is where I was born. And I went there and she showed me around the place and took me into the room, which was the labour room where I was born. And I mean, it upset her, but it healed me. It did a lot for me. It just like... So this is where it happened. This is where it happened. You know, it was kind of like um, that stuff. I, I like to do that stuff, you know? Yeah. So w one thing that's intriguing me here is that, you know, like the filling in of, of the answers, as you put it, you know, the the, the mystery solved. That yes. sounds quite sort of heady stuff, like heady, heady healing stuff. It's it's. Mm -hmm. it's it's a resolving okay. of questions, right? Yes, it's quite yes. a, yeah, it's a quite a intellectual. It almost feels okay. intellectual to me. Whereas um, the, there's another part coming here that's more about uh, grounding, like yes. uh, certainty. You know, yes. how do those things? How what what do those? How do those different aspects of that? Uh, sorry, how do those different aspects, the heady stuff and the and the heart stuff and the security stuff, how do those play for you in terms of um, what you think healing is about? Yeah, well, I, I agree with you that knowing, knowing the story might be more on the intellectual side of it, but being with, um, say, your birth mother, look at seeing somebody who looks like you, you know, I mean, you could when people could when when people when she'd say, "This is my son," they said, "Well, I can see that." You know, um, that, despite that the fact very, that she didn't have a beard, presumably. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you know, like you you could you can see it, and I'd never really looked like anybody except some girl in England thought I looked like David Bowie when I was a student, and so oh, that's that was cool. Cool. That's cool. <laughs> that was quite cool. Or yeah. Eric Clapton, I think, was the other. <laughs> Right. But, you know, I mean, maybe I've been checking out to see whether Eric Clapton was adopted because I also have Irish ancestry. Oh. But <laughs> who knows? Maybe he's a brother, a long lost yeah. brother. But it was very, um, that was very important. And I have a, a sister who was 18 years younger than me. And I'm very, very close to that sister. So she lives around the corner from me in Johannesburg now. So that was, you know, there is a, 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 a kind of thing with, with family that is, you know, it's good. And the, the strange thing is that you, you, you know, you find out, I mean, I was at university without knowing it um, in lectures with um, my aunt, my mother's sister. My cousin was a student that I knew him, but I didn't know he was my first cousin. That's really quite weird. You know, when yeah. he, he obviously didn't look like me or I don't know, but, he, yeah. you know, but so that, that is, that I think that's a very primal kind of thing. It's a very emotional kind of thing. Uh, being there, you, I felt very comfortable uh, with the, the the birth family. You know, I mean, like some of them were different from me, obviously, and it's 
kind of strange going to, you know, going into a home you've never been in before, and yet you've got a certain kind of entitlement because you are the son. It's a strange, mm. a strange sort of thing. But I think, you know, these things were uh, were part of that. And, you know, for people who there are adoptees who obviously will not be able to meet their parents because they're biological parents, because they're dead, don't want to meet them, etc. So it's not a, it, it's not a, a thing that you have to have if you don't have that you're not going to heal because you can you can heal in many ways it does it does help you to um you know i found it very healing and helpful to have that information and that story yeah um yeah it's interesting like um because it didn't it it didn't you you, you talked you you talked about um finding out when you were 10 accidentally and that yes. being seismic for you um, yes. and, and 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 I'm 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 wondering how seismic the uh, the, uh, the 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 rejection, you know, when 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 she wouldn't play the yes, you, she wouldn't play by the rules that you you set down. Yes, you, you didn't. That that wasn't a seismic thing for you when she. It doesn't sound like it anyway. No, no. seismic thing when she wouldn't play the game. No, I think that it got to a point where where I felt that. Um, you know the the it, the relationship was becoming difficult. It was becoming quite quite difficult, and so um, you know I let it I let it drop in a way. Uh, as I said, you know it was almost like I said I broke up with my mother. You know, like it was like I'd broken a pattern too. But I'd left the door open. I mean, the letter I wrote to her in response, I think it was I don't know whether were, there might have been emails in those days. Was I did leave the, I did say. Look, you know, I can't pretend that I'm just a, a friend of yours. Uh, if I, if you're not my mother, what kind of relationship do we have? And I, the door's always open. Now, what happened was a few years later, my birth, my biological sister, my younger sister, was getting married, uh, and she wanted me to do the speech at the wedding. Now there was a, a problem, you know. Um, yeah. so how are you going to? Yeah, you know. So the the mother and and the 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 prodigal son. So they brokered what what I think is called an intervention. <laughs> and uh, my brother-in-law to be did that. And um, we, uh, you know, we got back together. We met up and all of that. But it was a bit like in, in um, Faulty Towers, don't mention the war. <laughs> the yeah. famous line of John, don't mention the war. Yeah. So we never talked about the war, but then we we got on very well. For, you know, she came to my 60th birthday party. She, you know, she was um, became part of my life again yeah. until she had a falling out with my sister. And then I, I was eventually, um, you know, so there was not much help for that, but I never turned my back on her. And I was pleased that she was uh, in my life. And I, I have a lot of cousins. I do have a, a double family, you know, like uh, I have a lot of cousins now who are related through bi biology and a, and, a, and a very wonderful family through um, my adoption. So I've yeah. got a, like a double family. Yeah. And that's that's a healing. That's a lovely yeah. thing. And, you know, also that the, the um, I've had such wonderful responses from my um, adoptive family reading my memoir because it's given them certain insights and they have kind of like, um, they're even more proud to have me as a member of the family, which is, which is a, a really nice thing to, to have, you know, that you feel that's really genuine. They're not making an effort or anything like that, which yeah. uh, you sometimes always thought you were the outcast, you know, it's uh, not, it's, uh, you would have a, because, because of course, you know, and this is another thing that most um, adoptees, well, they say it's it's textbook uh, behavior that we act out quite badly as adolescents. We are far more rebellious than um, than your than other general kids, you know. And it's because when you're a teenager, it's kind of like you're trying to find out who you are. You're trying to decide who you are. You, you're trying to you know you'll be doing your signature. You you want to know whether you want to be Tony or want to be Anthony or you and what are your role models also because you look at look to your dad and you might think he's not cool if i really had my real dad maybe you know he'd be cooler what kind of role models that you look at film stars you're looking at this kind of stuff and we tend to be very rebellious and um 
and I was like that. I got into a lot of uh, into a lot of trouble, and uh, and didn't realize that that was a. In fact, what happened with me? I was sent to a, a boarding school uh, based on the, the the British, the great British public schools. You know, the yes. Eton Harrow type of places where children are abused. Great <laughs> and, inverted commas, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I was sent and I, was, I acted out badly and, and I self-sabotaged. That was my way of getting to, you know, they, they're going to lock me up here. Well, you know, I'm not going to work. I'm going, they send me to an expensive school. Well, you know, that's be it on their heads because I don't like it here. And so I self-sabotaged, which is rather, which is self-destructive. You know, but adoptees can be kind of self-destructive because I think, you know, uh, you almost like I always thought, you make it really bad for me, I'll kill myself and you can see how you feel about that then. So as a result, I failed um, my end, my final exam at school and had to rewrite school, my, 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 we call it matriculation in this country, equivalent of between O and A levels in England. And, um, and I only realised, uh, and I think it was, maybe it was Nancy Verrier's book as well, uh, that in fact... At the age of 13, being taken out of the family and put into an institution like a boarding school where there were rules and fagging and cold showers and caning and everything was a second abandonment. It was, uh, and that's why um, it was particularly traumatic. I might not have been as bad had I been a day scholar sent to the, a school around the corner. So those are realizations I only kind of came to. I thought, Wow, I can't actually blame it all on the school. It wasn't only the school's problem. Yeah. It was it was my problem, but a problem that that I carried within me as an adoptee. Yeah. So, to what extent you, you use that word realizations? To, to what extent do you think um, realizations drive healing? I think so because I think you you come to forgive yourself as well, and. Um, and I think it gives you more confidence and more understanding of yourself. And, you know, there's a, one of the important shifts, because th this is an interesting thing. So I had a, uh, I was seeing this therapist um, I told you about. So we're talking and I'm explaining all my relationship problems and all the things that, whatever. And she says uh, to me, uh, she said at one point, she said, oh, your problem is you have, low self-esteem and I said uh, I didn't know what self-esteem meant actually so I thought it was like having an opinion of myself and I said well look um, I don't really like blowing my own trumpet but I'm actually quite good at what I do and I've I've got some awards to prove she said that's not what I'm talking about I said oh well, what are you talking about she said if you don't have low self-esteem, why did you let your wife treat you the way she did? And I just sat there, you know, like I didn't have an answer. And then you realize that, you know, and that's, that was a pattern, uh, you know, and the, that I let my mother treat me that way because I had low self-esteem. And you actually have to do some work on that. I don't know. It's a kind of abstract thing, how you get that self-esteem back, but you've got to, it's something to do with realizing your worth, you know, that you have got worth. And I think it's kind of, deeply programmed in us perhaps because we've been discarded that we were worthless and you've got to kind of convince yourself that you've got that worth because you need to have it to be worth something to somebody else as well um, yeah I, I think can I, I, yeah can i just jump in there sure um, i i don't think it's convincing ourselves yes. I, I, I think it's a realization that convinces yes. us Yes. Okay. Do you, do okay. You make, see the difference. I guess what I'm trying so once, to say once is, you know, once you well, know that we can't make yeah. ourselves. Yes. We can't make ourselves. Um, we can't make ourselves love ourselves. Yes. I, yes. Yes. Um, I had a little moment um, yesterday on this subject, uh, and I, I was uh, I was swapping emails with. Uh, with a birth mother um, called uh, Laura Engel, she's been on the on the podcast. Lovely lady, and she's 
coming back on and we're going to do like a, she's going to be a, a co-host. She can interview some people that she knows. About. Yes. Um, and I was thinking, well, like she, 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 this lady, we've really just hit it off right from the start. We've spoken, we've only spoken maybe three times now on, on Zoom, you know, once before the podcast, once for the interview and once again, like, Two, two or three years later, last week, I spoke to her and I asked her about this. And she, she said, she, she, I said, I, I talked to her, myself, well, she, she probably sees me at my best. Um, and I, I, guess, I, I, I guess she thinks that I'm a really nice guy. <laughs> and and, and I, I, I filled up, right? Because me thinking of myself as a nice guy isn't something that I do a lot. Oh. Um, I, so, you know, I, I don't think we can convince ourselves to love ourselves. I put a post... Well, well, what, what, what are you doing, Simon? What are you doing for adoptees? What, what, you know, you are a nice guy. I mean, if you weren't a nice guy, you, okay. you, you're not doing this for the money. I know oh, that. No, no, no. <laughs> so, um, so, but I, I leave it. I, I want to I want to talk about this this thing because I think it's about realizing rather than convincing. Yes. Um, and I put a post out that I You're shared right. from last year, and it said something like, um, "We're we're not born believing that we're not good enough." Yes. It's, it's it's something that we pick up along the way. What if we could put it down? And yeah. I got a mixed bag of response, you know, and and. I, I I meant it as a genuine question. What if? And, oh. and I think I said, what if you can put it down rather than we? And then somebody came in and said, well, I can't because so-and-so, 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 and so-and-so. And I'm like, well, I, I, I'm, I'm just asking, what if? Oh. I'm just asking, what if? Because th- there's, there's, there's a little bit of hope there. Yes. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not blaming uh, you know, I, I'm not saying it's easy to do that. I, well, I don't. I think it's impossible to make ourselves change. Right. I think realizations change us. We yes. see something new. We yes. we 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 we, um, uh, we reunite with our birth mother. Um, we see something new. It helps us heal then uh, we realise that our birth mother is, we realise that, as in your case, a tricky, tricky situation. And we, something, something occurred to you to say, right, I want to set some barriers down here and, and some conditions. And, and, and then you, you set them down and it doesn't work. And you see something new. It's, and then, and then you look back and you think, oh, I, I was able to, to do that. You didn't, it, it, you didn't stand in front of the mirror every morning no. whilst no. brushing your teeth sh- saying, love yourself, heal. You didn't say, no. heal, Anthony, heal. Believe in no. yourself, love yourself, set some barriers. You, it, it, wasn't, it, it, wasn't a, it, it wasn't a a, a a conscious action. It wasn't a choice. I, I am, and, and this lady who... Who, who said, you know, like it's all right for you to say what? What if I can I? Well, I'm not I'm not blaming anybody. Oh. I'm not blaming anybody for not being able to do stuff because I don't think we can. I, I think insights oh. come to us, realizations come to us. Um, you know, we see something new and 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 it convinces us, and and a change happens within us, and and that, that's why realizations are the greatest healers. It's not about you know, a positive mindset to overcoming your adoption trauma. That's not what it is at all. I think the the word realisation, there's another word that flows from that because with realisation comes understanding. When you start to understand about something about yourself, it gives you that kind of insight. It's the realisation and understanding that leads to a kind of insight because it was that conversation that I had when this lady told me about um, self-esteem and I disagreed with her because I didn't know what she was talking about and when she did it was one of those moments of realization 
I wrote in my book, I said it was like scales fell from my eyes. I suddenly started to realize what I'd been doing wrong. And when I realized that and understood that, I kind of thought, well, I can I can change that. I can change that. And something happened inside me. It's a, it wasn't a conscious, you know, but I knew I was I teared up. I was kind of crying in the car yeah. driving home after that. And I knew I was going to be better. I knew I was going to be okay. And, you know, not long after that, about a year or two after that, I met the wife who I've been married to for 21 years now. And we are so happy and so perfect. And it's the, I had to be ready for her because, you know, if I can't take my damage into a relationship, it's also, you know, it hasn't got much chance from the get-go at starting off with, uh, you know, with, with a handicap. That's right. But that's uh, yeah. I, I, I'm lab. I'm I'm pers- I, You know, I'm I'm laboring this point really intentionally because yes. I, I I think you've said it. It's about realization. Um, and you know, I I teared up when I thought about myself as a nice guy. You know, like and and the, the, and to the tears wash the scales from the eye or something. But, but you, people. In, in in the general public, people say, you know, time is the greatest healer. Well, it's not. There's still adoptees <laughs> really struggling at, you know, old, old, older older age. It's not. Time yes. isn't the greatest healer. What is the greatest healer are insights. And, and that that's yes. why I try to mine the insights um, yes. of, of the guests to say, you know, look, this is what's helped Anthony. This is what's helped... Laura, this is what's helped Sally, or this is helped Elizabeth. Can, can that insight help you? Can that catalyze a change within you? Yes. And that's why I do the podcast, because yes. I, 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 we, we don't hear enough about, we don't hear enough about what, what heals us, right? So people say, well, I, I'm, I'm, doing some, I'm doing some somatic experiencing kind of a, new, a different sort of a therapy right at the moment right it, it's about it, it's it's not the therapy or it's not the support group it's what happens in the support group or you know you talked about the healing power you talked about i realized some stuff right in my book right so you we you, you you've said you know like uh, real realizing understanding uh, a, a new awareness it it's like where does hopefully listening to the Thriving Adoptees podcast, right? Mm. Help somebody see something that somebody, your your realisation um, start a, starts a, re, a realisation in, in somebody else. My realisation that I share on the podcast sparks a realisation in somebody else. Um, anyway, that's that's enough about me ranting on. But I, I, that's why I wanted no, to. That, that you know that realization, the understanding, the insights does lead to a kind of empowerment. It's a buzzword. You know, people are always talking about Indeed. empowerment, but it does sort of empower you as well. It does. You know, it's like in 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 your inner being. You know, and yes. um, yeah, for sure. That's it. You so know, that's, and, that's good. And you know that the other thing that is I, I've also found very healing is exactly what you are doing. It's adoptees communicating with each other. Back in the 1990s, I was when I was back in South Africa, and I was going to write a play uh, with, for radio about my adoption experience. Well, not, not the whole story, because the story hadn't finished, as it were. Um, but I decided I'd go along to an adoptee support group to do research you know i didn't need the support you know i mean i was cool i didn't need uh, any of that stuff but it was and it was like once a week in the evening and it was such a healing experience to be in a room full of people who who got you you didn't have to explain anything about you know much about being adopted you could share stories and it was and i'm still in contact with some of the people Mm. you know 25 years later or 30 years later it is almost you know who uh, and the, there's a, there's a wonderful kind of solidarity that there can be, uh, you know, with adoptees among each. You know, we're a we're a minority. <laughs> we're a little group. You know, we're a, a select group. And um, and I think that's and, and but then communicating and talking about our issues and how we uh, hope we've resolved our issues and that together is such a, a meaningful thing. And in a way, it's it's a, it's a special 
a special kind of a group to belong to, you know. That's yeah. what I feel. And so I think, you know, hats off to you for for, for what you're doing, Simon. It's a, a fantastic initiative, you know. Thank you. Thank you. And and I feel that solidarity too. And uh, and I feel that connection too. And that's why I, I do it to have yes. uh, to for the for the meaningful uh, the meaningful con- connections and 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 it's also for me about understanding the stuff that our birth mothers went through and our adopted yeah. parents went through and and just a, a one one point you kind of touched on it I wanted to draw draw it out because you, you talked about expectations I, I've heard a lot of people have mentioned this to me or you know one person mentioned I can't remember who it was now because it's years ago and it said I. As adoptees, we often go into um, reunion having done some work, and and our birth mothers haven't. Mm. So they're they're still in the same space as they yes. were, um, and and we, we've moved we've moved on a bit. You know, you said you know, mummy wants baby back. Well, she hasn't she hasn't moved on. She she, oh. has, she hasn't moved oh. on. Because yes. her, her, she's been stuck in her trauma, stuck in the secrecy. No, this is yes. no. I'm not blaming them. Uh, I'm just saying they haven't been in in that. Uh, and, and, and this isn't by any means everyone, but that underlining that as an expectation or a, as a as a thought, it it helps us un- have more empathy for our birth mothers if. Um, if it gets tricky or when it yeah. gets tricky. I, I never, you know, whatever difficulties I had uh, with my birth mother um, and in the last years of her life, she wasn't talking to me or to my sister. Um, it was almost a bit infantile, like you'll be sorry when I'm dead. And then she did die. But we are the ones who buried her. We're the ones who took her and interred her in the grave of her parents that she loved so much, etc. So, and I never uh, rejected her or or um, or uh, you know had lost or, you know, wanting to understand her. What a feeling of compassion for her. I understood. I tried to understand where she might not have uh, you know wanted to make that particular effort with me. She would say, you don't understand how I feel. But I was doing my best to understand yeah. how she felt. But, you know, because she had had a trauma as well. And I, you know, I felt that I'd kind of uh, got over most of my issues. But, I, you know, as, as you say, it's like the story you said. With the reunion, the adoptees have usually put in the work before they get there. Um, and quite often uh, birth mothers haven't. I, I don't know how, you know, you would think that social workers would help to prepare them, but, um, yeah, it's uh, it's, a, well, it's a, two different kinds of trauma, you know. Yeah. Um, um, but the birth mothers, it, it's a it's a bit like, uh, sorry, the social, it, it's a bit like the social workers, um, social workers in the, in the 50s for you or 60s for me, you know, th- those social workers were... They didn't. They didn't know um, because no. Nancy Berry hadn't written the primal wound. Basil Bang de Kolk hadn't published um, the body keeps a score. You know, the, the the social workers didn't. They 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 didn't know because it wasn't it, it wasn't known. So oh. yeah, yeah. There was very there was little knowledge about it. I I speculate um, in my book about you know what would have happened if my uh, parents had sent me to see a psychologist which would have been very unlikely because i mean you know only idiot only crazy people went to psychologists in the 60s you know that kind of thing but would the site would a therapist have had the would a therapist have thought that adoption could remotely have been yeah. anything could have been an issue they would have looked at probably other not no. probably not I, I hear stories from much later than then where therapists don't investigate the story and yes. uh, there's a lady coming on the podcast soon who's a therapist and was uh, a psychology lecturer in in LA uh, and she she was I don't know she got nothing to do with adoption but she heard something and um, she thought oh I wonder what she heard something on the news on I wonder how how big our 
how big our section is in our in our library um, for yeah. that adoption, and she found there's nothing there. So what <laughs> she actually did, what she actually or, or almost nothing. What she did was she she brought in, she got in touch with some uh, some birth mothers, some adoptees, and and brought the, brought them in, um, and the people shared some of their stories with these uh, uh, students who you know student psychiatrists, or I, I think they were. There was studying that sort of line of um, a subject, so she brought it in. She did something. She did something about it. She realised. So it, it, it's still it's still catching up. You know, it's yes. back to that. We're back to that two thousand years for most people to believe that they, the the the, the, the Earth goes around the sun yeah. rather than goes on, and the flat Earth. It takes a long time. Also, yeah. the internet stuff. So it's a little bit quicker these days. But still, people are slow to to change and to shift in there. Uh, shift in their perception. So, um, I'm conscious we, we've been on for a while. Is there anything else yes. that you'd like to talk about? Also, you're going to put some links to your um, to your book in the show notes. Is there anything else that I've not asked you about that you'd like to share? Not that I can think of offhand. Um, yeah. um, no, it's uh, you know one can carry on for hours and hours, but. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think we tend to do the same. We do. But, yes. That's a good thing. <laughs> but talking is a good thing. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's been a, a great pleasure to be in your company, Simon. Yeah. Thank you. And, and right. yes, if, if there's a place where you can put some information, my book's available everywhere through Amazon. Yeah. So um, I'll put the link in the show notes, yeah. yeah. Okay, fantastic. Cool. Uh, Thank and you, uh, is there anywhere that anybody can get in touch with? Have you got... Um, if you've got a, a website or social, what, what links would you like to include if people want to get in touch? You can, uh, well, I'm on Facebook, but uh, okay. I don't have a website, but you can also get my email address. Okay, I'll I don't put mind. that in the show notes. Yeah, yeah okay. I don't mind people writing to me if they want to communicate cool. with me. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks a lot. The World, the world Wide Web of Adoptees. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> um, and uh, and I'm uh, thankful, you know, the, the second, maybe third South African we've had uh on the show so i'm i'm grateful yes. for the little connections that are being made in in that uh, community yeah yeah thank you simon cool thanks a lot anthony thanks listeners we'll speak to you okay. take care bye, bye.